Hello, I'm Susan Elliott, the News and Special Reports Editor for Musical America. Today we're speaking with Harold Brown. Harold is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the Cincinnati Symphony. It's a senior position, it's a new position, and it's a potentially political position. So I'm very curious to hear how he does his job and what the challenges are. Hello, Harold. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So you have your job is new at the symphony. Was there yes. was was there ever um, a similar position at the orchestra that you're aware of? No, it's the first ever chief diversity and inclusion officer at the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. It did have a director of community engagement position, which we still have, uh, which did some of the work, but it was more programmatic and events related and less strategic um, and less comprehensive than this CDIO position. Right. So what kinds of things are you involved in? Um, how are you, do you sit in on a auditions? Do you um, discuss salary levels? I mean, what? tell me what you do. Yeah, so uh, it's important for me to note that I'm only four months into this role, so I'm right. still figuring out some things, but um, the, uh, the scope of the job is vast. Um, I think one of the really critical um, uh, factors in this kind of role is to be at a very senior level. Um, and so that gives you the ability and the authorization to work across the entire organization at all levels, all departments, uh, kind of like a CFO, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I, will, I am and will continue to be involved in, the, in many, many facets of the organization. So um, part of it is um, our culture and climate work. Uh, so I work closely with HR um, in thinking about how we can uh, continually strive to improve the experience, not only of our staff, but all of our partners, volunteers, uh, including audience members, frankly. So there's a, a lot of that kind of focus. Um, uh, working with uh, the artistic folks and the, and the musician uh, group uh, to think about diversity and hiring, to think about their culture and climate as well, um, and to think about uh, how we can uh, be more active in the community. We have a lot of uh, efforts going on where our musicians are out into the, in the community in schools and in other ways. So I'm involved in, in all of that, the community engagement part of the work. I'm involved in setting strategy, um, working with the board. Um, I've met with, with uh, probably two thirds of our board members one-on-one -on -one already. Um, so, it's, so it's a really vast role as we uh, continue to shape and refine what was already here when I started, which was um, a fairly basic D, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan that's embedded in our overall strategic plan. Uh, but we're building on that, uh, articulating that further and better, trying to attach measures and accountability to that. Um, and so for me, it's been listening and learning and now beginning to lead, frankly. And how did you come to this job? Did they come to you with a list of responsibilities or did you hear that they were looking or how did that happen? Yeah, so I am not a classically trained musician. I have uh, been working in um, issues of, of DEI across education, across philanthropy, uh, higher ed, uh, through a, a number of community service uh, board and, uh, and volunteer work. Um, but uh, I used to sing a lot when I was in college and high school. My son is a cellist, just graduated high school, has taken lessons from one of our orchestra cellists. Uh, my wife and I have been supporters and patrons for many years uh, of our symphony orchestra and our pops orchestra. So it's always been near and dear to me. Um, but um, as I uh, learned about this opportunity, the only question that I had was, I'm not, a, I'm not, not only, well, well, I guess two questions, not only am I not, sort of a classical music uh, expert, but I'm also not uh, a traditional DE&I trainer or, you know, or steeped in that very deeply. So I, I talked to some of my friends in the DE&I space um, and they were like, that's not what that organization needs. They need an internal champion, leader, collaborator, partner, uh, strategist 
Um, and as I went through the interview process, that became very clear. Um, and so um, I was thrilled at each step of the interview process with the commitment that has been made here around DE&I work, um, uh, particularly with the CEO and the board chair. One of the questions that so many orchestras and opera companies are facing is that they do not reflect the way their community looks, feels, acts, lives. How, how will you address that in members of the orchestra, for instance? I've noticed you have like one person, your, your assistant principal cello is black, and then you have a host of um, musicians in training, fellows who are, but not the rest of the orchestra. So how, do, how will you deal with that? Yeah, I think that's probably the most challenging part of uh, my role in our organizational goals around diversity. Um, you know, there are, uh, uh, we all know this is a very lengthy process for a person to become uh, orchestra level, professional orchestra level. Um, and so this is a long-term proposition, uh, investing early on in, uh, in opportunities to uh, create pathways for young people to aspire to this. But um, you know, at this point, we have probably eight vacancies. And so working with HR to aggressively recruit for diversity wherever possible, whenever possible. Uh, we're beginning to look at our audition process um, you know, not only what happens during the audition, but who comes to the auditions and uh, can we reach out to people who decided not to come and find out why. So we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at every aspect of this. We do have the diversity fellows. Uh, you know, I've read uh, that something like 14% um, of uh, students in our top conservatories are African American, but yet only about one and a half or 1.8% of our orchestra musicians in this country are African American. So you know, right. what's happening there. So we're looking at we're looking at this in a variety of ways because there's not just one silver bullet I think that's going to dramatically change what we see on the stage. Um, so um, I believe that's going to be the most difficult part. You know, it's easy easier to think about uh, diversifying the staff and the board. We're already doing that. We've done a lot with that. But when it comes to the musicians, because it is such um, a highly uh, uh, professional uh, role that has that takes years and years to refine to get to that level there's no easy there's no easy way to uh, to get to that so we're looking at that in a variety of ways and that's our goal though we do want to be more representative we also have a gender challenge we are not uh, where we want to be uh, in terms of uh, the number of women the percentage of women in our orchestra it's not representative of our community or not even in the amongst the top orchestras so that's another area where we feel like we can we can make some progress um, so right right how what are the mechanics of that? I mean, obviously you wouldn't, there would be a blind audition um, as there always are. Um, but so, obviously yeah. you, you wouldn't be one of the people listening. No. So how would that work? No, and I've talked to, to our music director and some others here about uh, some ideas that, that folks have. And um, uh, I think uh, a couple of thoughts. One is that um, we have to uh, understand that if there is, that we have to agree that the community representation um, is important. We have to agree and we have to commit to that. So, you know, if, for example, in the scoring of a, of a, final, of a final audition, you, have, you know, a 98 and a 99 and, one, and the 98 might be a person of color or a woman um, and, we're, and then we have a goal around that, then how significant is that difference? You know, so can we consider uh, other issues other than just that one percentage point in a score. Um, to me, you know, I, mean, I was in college admissions for a very long time and we, dealt, we grappled with some of the same issues. And we knew at the college admissions level that it was not going to be sufficient to just line up the highest test scores and that's your class. That's right. not benefiting anybody. So right. I think there are ways to think about, um, because it is important not to in any way diminish the quality and the excellence of the product. That's not what okay. this is about. And I think people kind of gravitate towards that and say, you know, when you're thinking about diversity, it must mean lesser quality. Absolutely not. I am not in favor of diminishing the quality and excellence of our final product. That's what we're known for. That's what's expected of us. Um, but there can be other ways where we can think about um, uh, how we can increase the pool, how we can, when all of the things being relatively equal, we can begin to make some choices that 
uh, cause us to be more representative of the community that we are serving. Uh, but I personally, just to answer your question more directly, I personally will not be involved in auditions or what I will be involved in trying to make sure that we have policies and procedures um, that can get us to the goals that we've set around community representation in DEI. Got it, got it. So I know you've only been in the job a few months, so you're not familiar with the orchestral world, um, which is refreshing, I have to say. <laughs> I'd say so too. <laughs> um, but this is going on sort of across the board, every, you know, in the industry. And right. um, two questions. One is, if, if it's, is it too soon for you to see how that's going? But number two, what sorts of qualifications do organizations need to be looking for, for someone who can achieve the goals that you are talking about? Yeah. Uh, to your first question, no, it's not too soon for me to make some observations. It's kind of funny, my third week on the job, I got a request from the League of American Orchestras to, to be a panelist at their conference <laughs> on this work and on this role. So, which gives you an indication of how few of us there are. To my right. knowledge, there are maybe about five folks that hold this role in major orchestras across the country. We know the Met, New York Philharmonic, and some other organizations now are, are doing that. But right. um, I had not met, I think Doris Parent of Philadelphia was the only other person that I had met who uh, held this role. Um, but you know, Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra already had a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan uh, right. as part of its strategic plan. So there were already some things in the works, works, including hiring for this role. When you think about this position and the qualifications and the characteristics that are most important, I think um, it is important to be able to work across an entire organization, be collaborative. Uh, I feel like in many ways I'm being asked to coach. Uh, I, what I'm discovering is that, um, and I don't want to be naive about this, but uh, everybody I've talked to seems to be if not excited, at least positive about uh, the efforts that we're making and the commitments that we're making around DE and I. But what they need are tools and more knowledge about what it is they can do and should be doing, and how they will be how it will affect their jobs. And so a lot of my work, I've spent uh, the last couple of weeks having one on ones with the other eight or nine senior managers to to be to begin to clarify what their specific departmental DE and I goals are and what tools and knowledge and learnings um, they may need to be able to accomplish those goals. And then also what other ideas, I, I, I'm finding out there's a lot going on that we don't talk about, that various senior managers already have in place some things that we that we don't have listed somewhere. So I'm very pleasantly surprised at, uh, 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 with what's going on, recognizing that there's more that we can and will do. Uh, but I say, you know, you have to be collegial, you have to be able to work uh, with all levels of the organization and all aspects of the organization, you have to be uh, strong enough to uh, to even, I don't wanna say check, but to, to uh, go back and forth with the CEO. I'm very fortunate, and for me it was a non-negotiable, that the CEO is an adamant um, believer uh, in what we're doing. And he right. is the champion and he's leading and not delegating in terms of the CEO's responsibility for this work. And to me, that's really, really critical. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also know, and he said it publicly, that I'm also a person that has to be able to speak very forthrightly to him um, about what I believe to be in our best interest. And if he were to slip up somehow, that he wants honest feedback from me. So you have to be strong enough and competent enough to be able to provide that across the organization as well. And then finally, <clears throat> I'd say um, you have to be adaptable and flexible. You know, so, uh, Different people approach this work in various ways. Some people come in with the sledgehammer, uh, you know, and, and, and immediately start talking about very deep and very uh, difficult concepts and issues. Others, right. and more my approach is, I think education and learning is a big part of this. Let's contextualize this work. Let's start with the why. Why is this important? Um, right. And then we can talk about the what and the how, and we can evaluate whether or not something that we want to do will get us closer to, to um, the, uh, the vision that we have for this. So. Uh, be careful about one's approach uh, when you come into an organization. I, I always say, you know, symphony orchestras and ours in particular has been wildly successful. It's not broken in many ways. So you just can't come in and, and act like everything's wrong and everything that's been going on is wrong. You have to build on what's here, recognizing that the community that we serve, it's changing. 
Um, you know, all of us have data that shows that in a decade or two, um, the audiences are going to look very differently. Um, and the traditional uh, sort of older, wider, wealthier populations that we've been serving and depending on are going to be much smaller. And so everybody needs to recognize that and, and be figuring out how we can make ourselves relevant to a broader swath of the community without giving up what's made us successful. I think the pandemic, the double pandemics have sort of woken us up on, on many levels. And mm -hmm. certainly the whole racist issue and diversity issue is, is one of them. That's part of it. Um, you know, I think uh, we have to listen to, uh, we have to decide who we are serving. Uh, you know, and, and, and then adapt our strategies and our focus towards that. Um, when we look at our specific community and we know that um, in our city, you know, we're, we're almost 50% African-American. I don't know the exact number for Latinx, but it's, it's in the teens, I believe. Yeah. Um, and we look, at, we look out ahead, uh, you know, whereas white people were, were two thirds of the population in 2014, by 2060, they'll be one third, they'll all be flipped. So that has real implications for how we, who we serve and how we serve them. I think the other issue is um, an appreciation for classical music generally begins early, right? In families and homes where you have exposure to it. And we're missing that in our public schools, for example, you know, classical music, music programs are slashed uh, to, the, to the bare bones, frankly. And I think that's an investment that we ought to be thinking about too. Because it's not just about pathways for musicians, it's also pathways for people who appreciate our music and become board sure. members and patrons and donors and volunteers. So I think that that has multiple payoffs if we can invest in music programs. And you know, we have a lot of programs where our musicians go out into the schools and work with orchestras and bands and, um, and music teachers. And we, we wanna to continue to build on that because again, it has, a, it has a ripple effect. It's not just about who's gonna become a CSO musician. It's all about how are we gonna build uh, the, the infrastructure that will continue to support and sustain us down the road. But yeah, we're going to have to, I don't think there's a blueprint yet for how to deal with the next 10, 20 years in terms of the changing demographics in this country, but we better be paying attention to that and be, and try to exercise some foresight. We're going to find ourselves in some, uh, some unfortunate positions. Do you see yourself going to um, getting involved politically with the city? in terms of when you talk about uh, education in the schools, arts education, would you, would, you, <laughs> would you suggest a meeting with the mayor and talk to him about that? Or is that something you would also do? I think we do. I, we have a different configuration than you have in New York and other places. Our, our public school system is not controlled by the city. It's still an elected board. So there's separation of powers there. You talk with the mayor and his folks about their support and, our, and the he recognizes the importance of the arts. With the public school system, our big district, um, I think it's been hit or miss. I think there are uh, some principals uh, who have sought out our services and we have a wonderful learning and education department that works closely with them. I'd like to expand and grow that. In fact, I had breakfast this morning with a principal of one of our inner city schools who would love to have us partner. And your background, because it isn't coming up through the arts, um... Tell us a little bit about how that has prepared you to do what you do. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I often uh, think about the parallels because uh, a lot of my career has been involved in education equity in higher ed as well as K-12 and working as an outsider to introduce change uh, from an equity point of view. So for example, I um, ran multicultural enrollment at Miami University, Miami of Ohio for a number of years here uh, in Southwest Ohio. Um, a, a very selective university that traditionally had single digits, actually usually four or five percent students of color out of a 15,000 student, student body. Very Where poor. Was what and school was this? Miami University, Miami of Ohio. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. A wonderful school, but uh, in a very small town, a town in which I grew up, by the way. Um, and so I was hired to dramatically increase the number of students of color there. Um, and so some of the lessons that I learned there are applicable here. One, it's not just about bringing in people. It's about how do you make sure that they stay and have a great experience. So right. we could actually get people in the seats. You can give away tickets or you can, you can figure out how to get people in the seats. But when they get here, do they feel like they belong? Or, you know, or do they feel like they're treated with respect and dignity? How, what will make them come back uh, on their own? Um, and so, you know, so because at the university, we've spent a lot of money on you know, scholarships and, and whatnot, trying to bring in students of color. 
but we noticed that the retention rate was far less than the majority of students. So we, we would ask questions about why is it that we didn't come back? It wasn't financial. It wasn't academic in most cases. It was, we didn't like the environment. Um, so that's an important lesson. I also think the musicians are very similar to professors, right? They're autonomous. They're at the peak of their profession. Um, and they, many of them want to just purely do what they do, whether it's music or whether it's teaching. Um, and so when you inject notions of diversity um, and, and issues that don't necessarily put meritocracy as the only priority, there's some questioning of that. And so you have to work with folks to help them understand the why and hopefully get them on your team. So we did a lot of that kind of work. I also would say, you know, when I was doing school reform work from an equity point of view, when I would go into an, an education environment, my approach was not to tell folks, teachers, principals that they were wrong or that what they had been doing for 20 or 30 years was wrong. What I would tell them is that the students that you now are teaching are different than the students that you taught 20 or 30 years ago. And the world for which we are preparing them is different. Therefore, you need to adjust your practices. And so in this organization, I say the same thing. It's not that the way that we've been functioning is wrong, but the reality is the community is different and changing. And as we said before, to a decade or two down the road, um, it won't be the same context from which we would draw uh, musicians or volunteers and patrons, et cetera. So there have been a lot of life lessons um, in my career that I think are very, very important. I'm sure you will be called upon by many people in the business <laughs> for advice. <clears throat> well, I want to connect with my counterparts. I talked to Doris Perrin in Philadelphia, and we, we would like, whoever is doing this work, um, we would like for us all to form a group that we can connect maybe once a quarter and share our learnings and uh, you know share our best practices. I think that's how we all grow and become better. Okay, well, thank you again, and much luck. Thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to share with us today.